so casual, you know? I'm about to hear some exciting stuff here. Um, I think everyone here knows me mostly. Maybe a couple of people don't. Hi, I'm Colin O'Malley, uh, the organizing director for Metro Justice, but also uh, uh, one of the founding members of Rochester Red and Black. Um, <clears throat> before introducing our, our speakers tonight, I just want to take a moment um, to give a sense of why Rochester Red and Black often focuses conversations on what's going on in Latin America. You know, it's not just out of a it's not just off out of a sort of generic excitement for the revolutionary fervor that is in Latin America, although that certainly exists, right? Um, but more importantly for us, it's um, you know the the organizational method of anarchists in South America, um, specifically coming out of Uruguay um, and extending from there largely to Brazil, Argentina, Chile, the organizational form of a specifismo, a style of anarchist organization from South America, is largely what's influenced and directed the formation of Rochester Red and Black. It's one of the central founding ideologies of the organization um, and organizational methods of the organization, right? So, so to us, this isn't just about looking towards uh, movements to be excited by them, but to look towards movements to learn from them, to look towards movements that, that in a lot of ways um, are doing things on the left considerably uh, more effectively, and considerably stronger than we are in the United States, and there's a lot that we can learn from those movements. And so, so we're hoping that today we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a lot of ways for us. Um, so we've got two fantastic speakers here. I don't know if you've seen uh, their books. Are there's a, there's uh, until the ruler the rulers obey the book that we've really pumped up some throughout this. Um, there's also another book that uh, Clifton Ross has uh, has edited here. Um, uh, the map or the territory? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that um, when you when you're out. Um, so Clifton Ross is a is a translator, uh, filmmaker, and writer who's traveled extensively in Latin America and worked in solidarity with social movements for more than 30 years. Um, his feature-like film, Venezuela, Revolution from Inside Out, uh, was released in 2008 by the PM Press. Um, so so uh, I think some opportunities there to talk a lot about, you know, what's going on in the book, but also we should, you know, check out, there's, there's PM Press catalogs here. Feel free to check out some of the other work that people have done, right? Um, and Marcy Ryan is a writer, editor, and organizer who's engaged in a wide variety of social movements uh, and organizational forms over the last 30 years, um, including pub uh, publication collectives, labor unions, community organizations, uh, her articles have appeared in, in women's, queer, labor, and left publications. She's also worked for the International Longshore and Warehouse Union for almost 12 years, writing its newspaper and serving as its communication specialist for, uh, for its organizing department. So everybody give them a, a great round of applause. Uh, uh, I was going to suggest people kind of move in a little bit, but you already have, so um, thanks. Um, we're going to try to project out there. Um, not a big crowd, but um, still, we both have to focus on that. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, the way this book has written me, or rewritten me. Um, I had certain assumptions that I brought to the project uh, when I first started back in 2008 um, with someone else, and uh, through the process of doing this book, uh, a lot, I've really changed my understanding, or my, my understanding has been changed by the uh, people who we interviewed. It's a, it's a book of interviews, and Marcy will talk a little bit about what the content is in the book. Um, and uh, I think that what we've done in this book is uh, presented a lot of uh, voices that haven't otherwise been heard. We've been hearing for a number of years about the progressive governments in Latin America, perhaps you have been. Um, people on the left have been talking about the progressive governments, but the voices of the people down on the ground, people who are active in the social movements, uh, often don't get heard in, our, in the United States. So we focused entirely, our book, entirely on that, uh, those voices. Um, and they've changed my understanding of how we might do solidarity in the future on down the road. Um, and the, the other book is uh, my uh, commentary um, I just finished it before we, uh, in fact, we picked up the book in Den Denver as we started this tour, um, and so it just it just came out after um, the tail end. It's sort of a complimentary volume, and we've been selling the two together as a set. 
um, because uh, we don't really make any comments other than what the people themselves say. We kind of, we've written an introduction that is based on um, the interviews, um, but I wrote a book that, um, from which I, draw, I drew conclusions uh, from the book and, and put them together. So um, Marcy's going to start off tonight with some of the stories that are in the book and do a little bit of reading from some of the, the stories. And I'll come back later. So just I wanted to thank you very much for coming this evening, taking your valuable time. And um, particularly, I want to thank Red and Black for organizing this for us and Rafa for co-sponsoring. Um, really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, as Colin mentioned, I come out of work in a lot of different social movements in this country. Uh, but in all of the contexts where I've worked, I've either been a community journalist or I've been working on communications, on helping people to articulate their message that they want to get out in the media. And in both of these kinds of work, I've become just so convinced of the power of story and the power of people talking about their own experience, uh, talking about what they want to change in the world and why. And that's really, as Cliff said, what's, what's in this book. Um, we have interviews with more than 70 different people from 15 countries, from Mexico all the way down to Argentina. Uh, there are all kinds of people. Some of them are activists and organizers. Some of them are people who write and study um, in the service of the movement. And some of them are, are people who just needed a place to work or somewhere to live and found themselves caught up in transformational processes just to make their way in, in a world in which they've been pushed to the margins by global capitalism. So we have all those kinds of people, all those countries, and a wide variety of movements. Um, we have many indigenous activists in the book because that's a surging force in Latin America now. Uh, we have many people who are organizing uh, against the extractive economy, whether that's mining, whether it's industrial agriculture of soy, of ethanol, whether palm oil, whether it's logging, uh, whether drilling, just opposition to extractivism is a very big theme that came out. Um, again, not as our intention in the book, but just looking at what people were saying to us about what was important to them. We also have uh, women and LGBTQ organizers, students and youth, uh, workers who are organizing in unions, organizing co-ops, or organizing to take over their factories. Um, we have people who are organizing to take over um, rural lands and, and urban housing. So very, you know, again, wide range of wide range of movements. And as we you know, Cliff talked about the way the book wrote him, and I think it, it kind of did that for both of us. It really, um, for me, it really brought home the role of independent and critical social movements um, in creating radical change, especially at this point in history. Um, when we look at Latin America at this point, what we see is it's really these movements who will be able to um, deepen and extend radical processes and bring some alternative visions into being. And there's lots of ways in which they do this, of course, but a couple I'm just, I want to pull out. One is that they are creating alternative spaces, autonomous spaces, and two is this work on opposition to the extractive economy. So just give you a little bit of sense of how that plays out. When we talk about alternative spaces, um, it's interesting, territory is a very important concept, but people define that in all kinds of ways. We're talking about people who, um, as I said, take over land to live on. I think, you know, the Zapatistas would be one example in Mexico. Um, another, probably the largest area, um, would be the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, the MST. Um, they began organizing in the late 70s in response to the dramatic inequality of land distribution in Brazil with something like 10% of the people owning 85% of the land. They began with people just squatting by the side of the road in very temporary shelters, a couple of sticks with a black tarp over them, and then moving onto the land, pursuing legal claim, because under Brazilian law, land must be productive. So they, they don't own it per se, but they can 
you know, apply for the legal right to use it, um, which is what they did, and they built more permanent settlements. Uh, they built a whole network of schools and cooperative farms. Till now, the people in the landless workers movement are in almost every part of Brazil and occupy uh, an area of land larger than the whole country of Uruguay. So territory in a very large sense. It can be territory in a very local sense, something I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute, a community center in a working class neighborhood in Uruguay called Galpón de Corrales. But it can also be territory um, in urban housing occupations. We, there's a wonderful story in the book of a group of people in Quito, Ecuador, who took over this area at the top of a hill. The, government had declared it a national park and then nothing happened there, it wasn't developed, it was kind of trashed out, and they waged a 15-year struggle occupying the land, building their housing, um, using civil disobedience, using political pressure, all the tools that they could find, till they actually, they got the, secured the title to the land, they built a cooperative, and now there's about 200 families who are living there. So, the occupation of urban housing spaces, um, and I mentioned occupation also of workplaces, um, particularly this um, happened in Argentina uh, in the wake of the economic collapse in 2001. You may very well be familiar with that. You may even have seen uh, this movie, the, the Take, by Avi Lewis and Naomi Klein. Um, really vivid and inspiring account of workers taking over their own factories. And one of the people who's in, that, uh, in the Take also appears in our book. His name is Lalo Perret, who's the Movement of Recovered Companies. And he really expressed the core thing about all of these efforts. He said, you know, need brought us together. He said, this method of occupying a factory, this wasn't optional. It was just the best thing we could do at the time. People needed to work. They needed to eat. We occupied the factory. And from that, got a whole new understanding of power. But all of these occupations are things really powered by necessity and really involving mass nonviolent direct action on really, you know, large, large scale. Um, and also another feature about these is that almost all of these spaces have been really experimenting with new forms of governance. Um, participatory democracy, if you will, but really practicing horizontal decision making, rotating, a rotation of leaderships, different strategies like that. Um, the um, Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, as large as that is, they do this. They have their their core um, decision-making body is what they call a base nucleus of 10 or 15 families in an encampment. And then the representatives from those nuclei will meet and the representative and make this talk about decisions for the whole camp. The camps have representatives they send up to a district level, to a state level, all the way up to the national coordination of the MST where decisions are discussed and then brought back down to the people for more, more discussion and elaboration. And they see this as a very key piece of their whole political process. Um, the MST leader in the, in the book who's interviewed Anna Hanauer, she says um, that participation is absolutely core because you can't be a subject in your own history, in your own movement, unless you participate. So they make a priority out of this participation. So I want to tell you just a little bit about a couple of these um, endeavors. One, uh, the Galpón de Corrales that I mentioned earlier. They, um, Cliff met the organizers of the Galpón uh, when he was in Montevideo because they have a news kiosk and right next to the daily newspapers and the good housekeeping type magazines, there were all these anarchist magazines. So Cliff started talking to them and they uh, invited him to come and, and uh, you know, see the project and, and talk to a few more of the members of the collective. And it's a community space in a working class neighborhood. Um, they um, have a very strong belief in, in, in working locally and people who are outside the neighborhood may be able to participate, but they really encourage anybody in the project to, to be very local. Um, they, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll read you what they, what they say about that, because that actually, that gives you a little bit more sense of the project. Um, this was a, um, one of the collective members by the name of Gustavo, and he says, Territoriality is a political concept 
that has to be included with other important libertarian ideas. They consider themselves libertarian anarchists. Um, he said, we try to build horizontal relations, direct democracy, and direct action at every level. As Pablo was saying, the cafe is moved forward by the neighbors. This is what we advocate, that the solutions to the problems involve those directly affected. So the, the cafe, the dinners, the community bakery, the community garden, the radio, all that is moved forward by the neighbors, the youth, the people themselves. There are no leaders. There's a horizontalism, and so collective participation is essential to us. Um, they've also done a couple of other things. They started a recycling sorters cooperative as a way of helping people to make a living. And um, they participate in direct actions, as those are called by the community. Um, the community is very concerned with trying to provide you know, secure health services, and particularly pediatric services. At one point, there was no pediatric doctor there. So the folks in the Galpon, along with the neighborhood, went and sat down in the highway uh, going to the neighborhood, did a, um, a road blockade until they secured the, the promise of a uh, pediatrician. Um, I think um, we also have a really fascinating interview from uh, another, an urban community in Brazil called City of Plastics in San Salvador de Bahia. Um, these, this is where people were occupying vacant housing and building urban communities. In this particular community, there's about 230 families and about 5,000 people all together um, in camps organized by the homeless movement of Bahia. Um, they are referring to their settlements as quilombos in res uh, out of respect to the uh, community, the Colombo communities founded by um, escaped slaves earlier in Brazil's history and recognizing the contributions of Af Afro-Brazilians. Um, very often these communities collect their, uh, connect their electricity and water illegally. And in City of Plastic, at one point they did this, they hooked up their electricity, the power company shut it off, they went and occupied the office of the power company until they got their electricity back. Um, they've also, um, they've been involved also in another kind of, not just the organizing to provide their space, but really organizing for um, political and policy solutions and creating something they call the Urban Resistance Front, which they pulled together 14 different movements around um, key issues they identified of jobs, housing, and um, anti-poverty work. Um, so they're trying to build this by consensus in urban communities all over the country. So they have, one of the things that we saw a lot is really this dual focus. They're building these autonomous spaces and kind of these new, new ways of doing things at the same time that they're really taking on some of the um, political questions in, with the systems that exist. So it's not really an either or for them. The, the other piece that is really important in terms of alternative visions that we saw in the book um, was the intense energy that's going into resisting resource extraction. And this was um, just in virtually every community from from Guatemala on, on south to Chile, um, very um, uh, determined resistance and, and insistence on a vision that includes ecology and the health of the, their communities and the health of the planet in the social vision that, that they're working for. Um, many of the interviewees talked about why. I think you probably um, can intuit because it's not so different from communities here who are fighting fracking, for example, and some of the concerns they have, particularly about water. But I want to share with you what two women from uh, an indigenous women's federation from the Amazon area of Peru had to say. Uh, one of them is Luzmila Shirisente, and she's the president of this indigenous women's association. She's talking about logging and, as a form of extraction. And she said, the logging companies cut the big and the little trees, ruining the environment, not only for the indigenous people, but for all Peru. The oil company doesn't act like this is its country. It throws its waste out and kills the fish and poisons the water. When the land is contaminated, we can no longer grow our produce, which we grow ecologically. As women, we've never benefited from the 
agreements the government has made with the logging or oil companies. They only come and try to buy us off with cooking pans or notebooks, which is an insult to our indigenous communities. For us, our territory is the lungs of our generation because our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents have died defending these lands, our mother, our blood. And her co-organizer, Sadi Salinas Ponce, who is the health secretary of the organization, elaborates on that. She says, the only thing we want now is to be left alone, and they don't come to take away the only thing we have, which is our nature, which we consider to be a part of our very lives. That's why they don't understand that if they hurt nature, they're hurting us, since we're the only ones who feel our environment as part of our feet, our hands, our heads. There is a great deal of anti-extraction organizing going on in, in Peru. Um, we talked also with, um, actually, I say we, uh, the, a lot of the material in, in the Peru chapter came from an organization that collaborated with us that's based in Lima. They're called the um, uh, Program in Democracy and Global Transformation, uh, Programa de Demo Democracia y Transformación Global. Um, and they, they, had, they put out a, a book called Am Amazonia Rebelde and collected some of this material and, sh and they shared this with us. And they interviewed also a man by the name of uh, Miguel Carrion from an area uh, north of Lima called Ayabaca. And Ayabaca um, has, uh, is a forest area that is actually watershed for three of the very important areas in, in Peru. And it's a, one of the few intact ecosystems left in the country. And since it's about 1997, the people in the Ayabaca area have been fighting um, an open pit mine uh, company that's now owned by a Chinese consortium has been trying to come in and, and dig an open pit copper mine. And they've been resisting with a whole, um, just a whole uh, a toolbox full of, of tactics. They began uh, first by surveying the area the mining company said they wanted to come in to be sure, yeah, this is our land, we have the claim on what happens here. They did a survey. Um, the mining company started sending people in doing trainings uh, to kind of advocate for why this would be good for the community. So um, uh, Magyal and, and um, several other people he was working with went out and actually um, Countertrain, you know, came to you know confront those people, and his his comment was that really from that very point, um, the mining companies so division. He said peace ends when a mining company comes in because it just um, some people are are persuaded, and others are standing very very firm for preservation of their community. So this is probably also again something that is um, is familiar, um, but they. Have done, so they've done a whole bunch of different things. One thing they did that kind of struck me, because their communities are intact, they're very rooted in area, they know each other, um, they established gates in the communities and watched for strangers so they would know if somebody was coming in and, and, and starting trouble. They also did marches, they did a local referendum in three areas, Ayabaca and two surrounding areas, where they had 90 4% of the population um, opposed to mining, and they use this as a way of then bolstering their work to pressure the government to um, revoke the permits to not let the mining go forward. Um, they, they build alliance with, with campesino groups, women's groups, community associations, grassroots environmentalists, and so they, they do all of these things, and they have uh, they have a perspective also on how these ideas of democracy and participation relate with this question of, of development. And their vision of development, he says, um, when we're referring to sustainable development, we not only speak of economic projects, but also cultural and intellectual growth, what we call human development. Democracy for us is not only casting a vote for an elected official, Democracy is full participation in decision-making at all levels, which is why we carried out the public referendum as an expression of true democracy. We know there are laws and regulations that recognize individual human rights, but for us we also value collective rights. What we value most is our land. What we appreciate most 
is our Mother Earth who gives us food and life. So just these are these are just a few little stories, but just to give you the big picture, they're, they're snapshots in a whole panorama of, of resistance. There is uh, an organization based in Chile uh, called the Observ Observatorio de Conflictos Mineros in America Latina, the uh, Observatory of Latin American Mining Conflicts, but it's an effort by 40 different grassroots groups um, all over the continent to network to document all of these conflicts, to support each other, and to also um, encourage more international solidarity. And this, this organization, the acronym uh, in Spanish is OCMAL, um, when I checked this just a few, a few days ago, they have documented 205 different conflicts around the, around the continent, some of these involving multiple communities, so more than 300 different communities that are affected. And uh, one of the key one of the things that happens in all of these areas um, also is that the resistance is criminalized by the government. So I think, you know, these, one of the areas where we see really sharp contradictions between the social movements and the progressive governments that Cliff is going to talk about in just a couple minutes is around this issue of development model. Um, and the, um, Akmal says, if I can find, I will give you their exact. Um, I'm, not, I'm not finding it, but they basically what they say is that you know that that criminalization is happening across the continent, regardless of whether it's a pro progressive government or a more right wing one. That community leaders, faith leaders, and you know just people active against resource extraction are all being hurt by this. Um, for, a couple, for one example that I think kind of says it all, in Ecuador, um, there's a, a man by the name of Humberto Chilongo who is one of the foremost indigenous leaders in that country. He was, at the time we, in, we interviewed him, was the um, president of the uh, Confederation of Indigenous Nations of Ecuador, CONAI. And, the government of Rafael Correa, which is known as one of the most progressive in the region, right, has um, Chilongo and seven of his um, fellow activists up on terrorism charges uh, for a protest they did at an oil bidding auction. Is that the time? Oh, <laughs> I'm almost done anyway. Um, they, they, um, we're trying to keep our presentation relatively condensed so we have time to actually talk. Um, so Chilongo was arrested on terrorism charges, and, and, and the actual thing that he is trying to do is, he says, we, we are trying to take control of our resources from the multinationals so we can have the say in what happens with our land and not be blackmailed by any corporation or any government, roughly what he says. So um, that gives you some sense. In, in Bolivia also, huge, huge conflict over a roadway that the Morales government really has been backing very strongly through an indigenous territory and national park. And that roadway is really for the benefit of Brazilian transnationals. There we are. Um, <laughs> oh, we have more to say later. <laughs> I think that actually, that actually Pretty, that, so that's another quick example from Bolivia. But I think that, that the, the segue here is that Cliff then will talk some about a bit of the background of these progressive governments and why these contradictions are coming up and how that might change our understanding of solidarity. <clears throat> so how many of you have heard of the pink tide? I mean, are familiar with what it means um, a few of you. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to just go through this really quickly and real briefly. Um, in the 20th century, we saw Latin America trying to establish independence, economic independence, through a process of import substitution industrialization. Um, the beginning of the 20th century, they were, uh, it was basically ex extractive economies, that is to say, uh, they had resources. The United States was uh, extracting them. It took over from Spain. The extraction Spain had already 
um, extracted a huge amount of the silver. They, they say that from Bolivia alone, from the Cerro Rico, which uh, is in San Luis Pot in Potosí in, um, in Bolivia, they could have built a bridge in, of silver all the way to Spain with the silver that was extracted. Um, the United States took over from Spain, essentially, in, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, and the, the same extractivist uh, uh, relationships with Latin America, you know, basically uh, taking out the raw materials, selling back manufactured goods. Uh, with the Depression, that totally fell apart. Um, Latin America became, was, we, had, we went into a downturn, we all know about the Depression here in the United, United States. What we, many of us don't know is that it, was, it hit Latin America f far harder. Um, so the governments of Latin America, at that point, a lot of them were um, modeling themselves after the corporatist regimes of Franco and, um, and Salazar in, in Portugal. Um, the corporatist governments comes out of Catholicism, we know it uh, today is fascism, um, but co corporate, all the corporatist governments weren't fascist, but you have particularly uh, Mexico with the PRI, um, you have Juan Perón in uh, Argentina, you have uh, Getulio Vargas in, in Brazil, and a lot of these other corporatist governments, frequently led by military generals uh, or ex-military, uh, um, began to take over, uh, take the lead in developing the industries of their countries. This led to, uh, obviously, a working, the development of a working class in Latin America. So through the 20th century, you have import substitution industrialization, i.e., um, trying to substitute the imports by development internally with their own manufacturing. That was the idea. 1980, this hit a wall because uh, the, there was all the Arab money floating around in the U.S. The U.S. banks was, had it to lend. The, the result, of course, U.S. banks got the Arab uh, money, oil money, and they had to invest it for that. The uh, Arab governments, they found uh, willing hands, receiving hands in Latin America, because these governments uh, that were continuing to industrialize and were hoping even to industrialize to the point of being able to export were uh, ready to take more loans. And when Paul Volcker came in in 1979 and uh, with Carter and then on with uh, Ronald Reagan here in the United States and raised interest rates because of our own situation here in the U.S., it dramatically impacted Latin American, uh, Latin American governments and particularly Mexico felt it wasn't going to be able to pay off this. So there was the fear of a great default, and, uh, which didn't happen because the, the good cops came in. You know, the IMF and the World Bank, oh, we'll, we'll help you out here. Don't worry, got it all under control. All you've got to do is sell off all those, all those industries you've built up over the past 50 years. Um, so they began privatizing. They began the whole process of privatization. We all know about neoliberalism, or maybe some of us don't know, but in brief, neoliberalism uh, started with essentially they had the Chicago Boys uh, under, under Pinochet when you know, the U.S. overthrew uh, the democratically elected government of Allende. Um, and Pinochet became the, the dictator. Um, he began, the, he was the first uh, guinea pig. Uh, Chile was a guinea pig in, in um, neoliberalism. And Pinochet uh, uh, ruled for a number of years, uh, ran the, the, the country into the ground. But, you know, uh, that's what, what neoliberalism tends to do. Um, and then through the 80s, through the 80s, the, there was the, the um, it was called the lost decade in Latin America. Incomes were cut 10% across the board. People were thrown out of work. Military dictatorships came to impose discipline on the people who needed disciplining, according to the military dictatorships, because the workers were rising up saying, we want our jobs back. Um, the, the, there were the guerrilla insurgencies in Central America. That's what I remember of the 80s, because I went down to Nicaragua in those years. It was the Sandinista Revolution. A lot of a response, counter-response to this neoliberalism. But it, it came to an end in 1990 when history ended. You remember when history ended? Uh, Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history. Um, some of us are, have, have survived that moment and gone on to do other things and make our own history. But that was... Uh, but that was the, uh, when the Soviet Union, you know, said uncle, uh, the United States became the victor of the Cold War, um, and Latin America, all the regimes just essentially went, said, okay, well, we'll do what Washington says now. I guess there's no alternative. You know, there is no alternative. Tina, that's what Margaret Thatcher's famous uh, saying, you know, that's all we can do. 
So the center left and the left began trading power through the 90s in Latin America, and the United States began then to kind of disassociate itself from the death squads it had managed in El Salvador and the dictatorships that it had met, helped uh, prop up in all of South America and began promoting democracy because after all, uh, and it started with, uh, with Chile again in 1990, the center left came into power, the Concertación, and of course they ruled under the constitution that Pinochet had left them, um, which of course included neoliberal political economic policies. And the United States was quite happy. It applauded the, the left coming into power because, first of all, uh, the, the, the radical left didn't come into power. And the left that came into power was willing to, um, you know, uh, implement the Washington consensus, neoliberalism. So by the end of the, the, that decade, the beginning of the, uh, the 2000s, uh, people in Latin America got completely fed up with their traditional two-party systems and began electing third-party players. Now, what, I did, what I've left out of this whole thing is that the social movements that were really coming up in the 70s, and particularly in 1990 with the indigenous movements in Ecuador, very strong upsurge of activity there. Um, in the Caracaso urban movements, explosions against neoliberalism in Venezuela um, and around Latin America in different places. Um, and social movements beginning to organize under this new space that was opening up uh, post-dictatorships and post-guerrilla uh, wars when anyone who um, protested would have been associated with a guerrilla and murdered. Um, so th there was this opening and uh, th in this opening the uh, social movements began organizing. Some in Ecuador they began to think about taking power. They actually came to power at the beginning of the millennium in Ecuador with uh, Lucio Gutierrez who immediately betrayed them. That's another story. But what was interesting is that at, at the beginning of this millennium we begin to see third party uh, uh, governments coming to power. It's called the pink tide because they weren't really red. They were just kind of little pink. They were kind of, they, they, they advocated in some cases the socialism of the 21st century. Um, and that would be, and I would say there are three of those governments which advocated for that. And that was uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia with a movement towards socialism. Uh, Rafael Correa with the Citizens Alliance in Ecuador, and Hugo Chavez, of course, in, uh, in Venezuela, now uh, being followed up by Nicolas Maduro um, with the uh, PESU. Uh, he came to power with the, uh, Chavez came to power with the movement of the Fifth Republic, but the, the, he changed the party, abandoned, threw, threw them overboard for the PESU, organized the PESU because the movement of the Fifth Republic had become so corrupt he couldn't reform it. And then, of course, the PESU became so corrupt he couldn't reform it too after that. But um, th they were advocating for the socialism of the 21st century. They were more viewed as a lot of, by a lot of people as more radical socialist governments. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that because my focus, uh, I wrote the introduction to Nicaragua and to Venezuela because those are two countries that I'm most familiar with for our book. Um, and, I, and my film, which came out in 2008, was uh, kind of very much pro-Chavez, very critical, but pro-Chavez and pro Bolivarian. Um, I have done 180, and I'll kind of explain a little bit why I've done a little bit of a 180 there. Um, so among these other uh, 20, these other uh, governments of the of the Pink Tide, uh, we could think of Lula and Rousseff in uh, in uh, with the Workers Party in Brazil, um, Vasquez, uh, Taurei Vasquez, and uh, Pepe Mujica in Uruguay with the broad front, the uh, Frente Amplio, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner um, with the Justicialista Party, that's the old Peronista Party, so there she's kind of associated also with the uh, populist. Um, and then um, Fernando Lugo, briefly, the Red Bishop of, of Paraguay, he was known as, um, and he uh, was overthrown in a coup in 2012. Um, well, some people would call it a coup. Uh, and I would probably call it a coup. Um, Mauricio Funes and Salvador Sanchez Seren in uh, El, El Salvador with the FLN, you know, former guerrilla organization turned um, electoral party, um, the Frente Farbundo Marti uh, Liberación Nacional, and then finally in, in Nicaragua, the FSLN, uh, Frente Sandinista Liberación Nacional, and under Daniel Ortega, who'd now become a populist caudillo, he'd basically taken over the party. And go, I go into that in the introduction to Nicaragua. Um, and then briefly, there was uh, there was uh, Mel Celaya in in Honduras. He was the left wing of the Liberal Party. So these were all collectively named the Pink Tide. 
Um, and so none of these were really proposing socialism. All of these were proposing, proposing some kind of reform capitalism. Um, uh, uh, Alberto Acosta, uh, uh, social movement activist and anti-extractivist uh, uh, um, activist, uh, des describes them as post-neoliberal regimes. Um, and and the, the socialism is kind of a branding. It's kind of a branding that's being used um, because that, the radical um, rhetoric really wins votes in Latin America. Clearly, after um, you know years of you know talk of democracy with um, that comes out of the barrel of a gun, uh, that doesn't win votes the same way anymore. Um, but when we when we went to uh, Uruguay, and the way I, the reason I say that uh, this book wrote me was because when I first started doing this book in two thousand and eight uh, with another person, uh, rather than my wife, Marcy and I are married. This is my wife, and she came into the project later and saved my. Not not just my but but save the book. She pulled it out of the fire, as it were. Um, when I when I first started working on the interviews and collecting the interviews and traveling around and doing the interviews, um, I was very much in favor of the pink tide governments. I really saw a, I had a lot of hope in them, particularly in the Venezuelan process because they were trying to develop socialism in the 21st century with, with cooperatives. And I thought there might be some possibility there that would be different than the idea of of nationalizing all the industries and taking it over and doing the same thing that the Soviet Union had found didn't work and that, this, uh, that China had found didn't work uh, or only worked, uh, they have managed to work that out in some ways but that won't get into that. When, um, but as, as we got all the interviews together, we went down, Marcy and I went back uh, when in 2012 when the book kind of came to us uh, completely to finish, became our project, we went to Chile uh, Marcy wrote the introduction to Chile, and we went to Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay to finish up the, some interviews, get some last interviews, and then um, to talk with Raul Sabechi about the, the, the foreword. And so when we got to uh, Raul's house, we pretty much had everything together, and I was looking at these 15 countries, 70, at that point it was probably more like 100 interviews we had to cut, a lot of the interviews, and thinking, my God, my head was spinning. I was like, how do, how do these things fit together? And I came into his, the, his house. He welcomed us in for uh, uh, tea one morning. And I, my, I just said, you know, Raul, I'm, we're trying to conceptualize this to, so we can write our introduction. What do you see as a major problem confronting the social movements of Latin America today? And without hesitation, he just said, oh, the progressive governments, of course. Major problem. I said, could you break that one down for me? He said, well, of course. I mean, look, they problematize poverty, not wealth. And, and, and if you problematize poverty, you have wealth. Let's, let's, let me put it this way. These, these governments have designed their policies. They have walked in the footsteps that, that were left behind by Robert McNamara. You know, you're the architect of the Vietnam War and the war on poverty. Um, for Johnson, uh, oh yeah, and the uh, president of the World Bank. Um, so th these these governments are essentially, um, and when we think about the war on poverty here in the United States, what what was that all about? I mean, it was one way of uh, undermining uh, the radical uh, movements and the radical demands in this country. It, and it really effect, well, worked quite effectively, and I think that's probably one reason why uh, it it's been. Uh, adopted now in this new context, and in this new so in this new context, these progressive governments and, as Marcy mentioned, the right-wing governments all have exactly the same economic policy. It's called neo-extractivism. Now, how is neo-extractivism different from extractivism in the 20th century? Well, remember, extractivism in the 20th century is when you 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 know you have the United States, the imperialist power of the United States, and their mining companies coming down and taking all the wealth prime resources out of Latin America and selling back manufactured goods. Well, now it's China that's coming in and taking all the wealth out of the, the soil and selling back manufactured goods. And it's being framed as South-South cooperation. And let me give you an example of this, the best example that I can think of. I was When I was in uh, Ecuador uh, in 2008, I, I, uh, there was a lot being made of the um, the Korea was planning to shut down the Manta uh, naval base 
you may have heard about that. The, the naval air, uh, naval, the naval U.S. naval base uh, at Manta. Um, he was making a lot of this, and and the Ecuadorians were really excited, and enthusiastically backing Korea uh, in this in this process, and uh, because it was a, it was a step toward you know establishing a national sovereignty and and telling the gringos to go home and 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 all this. Well, I went to talk to his transportation minister, or a man who was working with transportation, designing in the transportation ministry, a, a man whose last name was Petty Hon. And I wrote about this in uh, Counterpunch when I was still publishing a Counterpunch. Um, in 2008, you can go back and read it. Uh, I, I asked him about the, the base. He said, oh, well, you see, the, the point here is that there's all this soy being grown in Paraguay and in Brazil and Argentina. And the problem is getting it out of there to China. So what we're doing is we're designing a, mul a multimodal corridor up through the Amazon and then over, over land to the Manta base, the Manta base, which we'll have back, and then we'll ship it all out to China, all this soy. So um, in fact, this issue of national sovereignty is essentially switching from, you know, a naval base, U.S. naval base, a good thing, a good thing to get it back for Ecuador. But essentially what is being done here is, you may have heard of, have you, has any of you heard of IRSA, I-I-R-S-A? It's kind of like a lot of these other designs that, that they don't feel we need to know anything at all about. We shouldn't bother our little heads about because it doesn't concern us after all. Um, but IRSA was the infrastructure uh, improvement plan for South America. And it's only mentioned as a footnote in, in our book because so much of this we're discovering after the fact that what these people, you know, were talking about. But IRSA was a, was a plan designed by Fernando Cardosa, the ex-neoliberal pres president of, uh, of Brazil who was president just before Lula came in. Um, and the idea was to re reconfigure the infrastructure of South America for the process of globalization, to better facilitate the extraction of all the wealth. Um, it hasn't been going out of the continent quickly enough for them. So um, this fits in perfectly with that IRSA. And if you look at the plans in, in Venezuela, they fit also perfectly into the IRSA plan. Um, when I began thinking about this, it, it occurred to me that perhaps I needed to go back to Venezuela. So I went back to Venezuela last April, and then um, and I happened to be there. I arrived the day after the elections uh, that took place when Maduro was elected. Um, I wasn't allowed in the country. I had to wait in Colombia. for. I always go through Colombia and then take go over land to because I go to Merida, which is easier coming in through Colombia. But I wasn't allowed to get in, so they, they closed off the border for an entire week for the election. Uh, I was puzzled by this. Um, and I, I, the first story that came out was that the Salvadoran death, death squads were trying to kill Maduro, which I found just mind-bogglingly uh, 19 Orwellian, Orwellian. I mean, the death squads in El Salvador have been abandoned for how long? Um, then the next story was, oh no, it's the Colombian paramilitaries who are trying to infiltrate into Venezuela and kill Maduro. And I thought, are they, are they going to be going to the border and asking for visas? I, I, was, I found this all very puzzling and uh, bewildering. And uh, so then I got into Venezuela and I began to see things in a very different light. And I would suggest that we see things in a very different light if we, if we, if we consider this, that what is happening in Venezuela is that duck. I can't go anywhere with it. Um, so let me just kind of read you this. Uh, I would suggest that, that everything looks quite a bit different when we think of what's happening in Venezuela, not as the socialism of the 21st century, but rather as uh, the populism of the 20th century. Um, and I think the, the, the best little uh, thing, uh, if, for those of you who are familiar with Venezuela, uh, consider these five points. Kenneth Roberts lists five traits of populism. One, 
a personalist and paternalistic model increasingly charismatic and based on leadership, two, a multi-class political coalition concentrated in the lower social sectors, three, a process of political mobilization directed from above to below that skips the institutional mechaniz mechanisms of mediation or subjects them to a more to more direct ties of the leader with the people. In other words, subverting all the institutions of democracy, uh, as has happened in Venezuela. Four, an amorphous or eclectic ideology expressed in a discourse that exalts the subalterns, the oppressed, or is anti-elite. And five, an economic project that uses redistributive or clientelistic methods on a massive scale so as to build a material base so as to gain the backing of the popular sector. Um, think of the pre in the 20th century. You know, every election cycle that came around, they would go into the towns and bring the, the, the tacos and have the little feasts and throw the parties. Everyone would go out to vote for them, and the next day they would clean up and they would leave and not be seen again for another six years. That's what we're seeing in Venezuela, and that's what we're seeing in Ecuador, and that's what we're seeing largely in Bolivia. Um, it's really exciting to see people at the bottom coming out and, and acting. But when they're acting uh, to support a caudillo, a populist leader, a strong man, who really is only representing their interests to get their votes, um, and whose projects are now, I would argue, and I think if, you, if you, in my book I'm arguing, is it their, the project is in complete collapse. Uh, Venezuela's bonds, just for example, and I know I'm going over time, but I'm gonna, and I'm gonna tie it up here. Uh, Venezuela's bonds are being were valued in January of this year at uh, just one rank above above Ukraine. It's being viewed as a failed state, and it is effectively a failed state if you look at the at the economics of it all. And I go into all this in my book, and I don't have time to go into it all here. We could maybe pick this up in in in, in the discussion and and so forth. But what is it? Where does this leave us? I think where this leaves leaves us is that the United States and and the transnational state. Um, the, the, the corporate uh, powers um, and China, all the, the transnational corporations, and uh, are quite happy to have whatever government is in there saying whatever it likes, as long as it continues to maintain the policies of the transnational capitalist state, as, they were, as are outlined in, uh, in all the, the, the agreements. Think of it this way. Uh, you can think whatever you like, and you can say whatever you like in this country, as long as you stop at the red lights and stop at the stop signs and, and uh, go when the light turns green and slow down when it's turning yellow and so forth. Um, where we, we need to look for the possibilities for radical change in Latin America. And what do I mean by radical change? I mean change that's in the favor, really in favor of people. And I'm talking about making them more critical, educating them, helping them uh, uh, empower themselves, um, uh, organizing communities, um, uh, uh, giving them uh, uh, giving them spaces and, and opening spaces where they can practice their culture and their language and their traditions. Um, if we want that, and if we want to, and, 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 and for a diverse, a div for diverse movements uh, that hold diversity and cherish diversity at their very core, we need to look at the social movements, um, and I think these voices, uh, the voices of these activists, were. I, f I feel so honored that Marcy and I have been able to uh, to to, to uh, bring them to you um, and to people in our country. So um, I think that's about all I have to say. So I think we could we're ready to kind of get into a discussion with you and. Uh, Have some questions or yes. Um, you mentioned those five uh, characteristics of the current populism or the populist. The fifth one sounded okay. I, I, I didn't think the uh, first four sounded so good, but that fifth one was, you know, to um, what was it like? Uh, we spread we the wealth a little bit. Clientelistic methods on a massive scale to build a material base so as to gain the backing of the popular sector. Yeah. Seems like a good idea <coughs> if you could divorce it from your first four. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think that um, 
One thing about the pink tide governments is that they were a break with decades of austerity and neoliberalism. So the fact that they were restoring some of the social safety net was a good thing. But I think this gets back to um, Raul Zabecchi's very uh, succinct comment about problematizing poverty and not wealth. When you're just passing around the goodies, you're not really developing the power base of the people. You're not really sharing the decision making in a meaningful way. And one of the things about populism that we actually saw very clearly happen in, in Venezuela that was quite insidious is this, um, one of the other characteristics refers to um, uh, direct communicate, direct mobilization of the base by the leader. So skipping the mediating, well, the mediation, the mediating organizations, that's a social movement, those are the organizations that people build and control that then can be independent and hold the governments to account. So when you're missing those, you're really missing um, a very critical political element, which we see why we keep talking about extractivism. It's the social movements that are really, you know, pushing back on these governments who say, yeah, we need to be extracting these resources because we want to redistribute to people, we want to give people better health care. You know, Venezuela had all of these missions, but it was just all, um, you know, kind of handing out, and all based on extractivism, which is not sustainable. Um, and so that's the, you know, and then people and communities. So you see all these, these different pieces kind of tie up. Another problem with this, too, is that um, it, it, we're talking about, now, it's a good thing that people down at the bottom are getting some of the oil money. That's really a good thing. But the, uh, the idea that they weren't getting it before, the problem is that, that, that the, the benefits to the people go up when, they're, when the price of oil goes up, and it goes down when the price of oil goes down. So that Chavez happened to have come in when, when uh, the barrel was $7 a, a barrel, and, and he didn't change any of the policies of the previous governments at all. I mean, if you read uh, Javier Corrales, I just finished reading an essay by him in a book called Leftist Governments of Latin America. Um, in, essentially, he just followed the same pattern of everyone else. And so when, when the oil went from uh, $7 a barrel to $129 uh, a barrel, um, suddenly everyone was doing really well, thinking that the problems were being resolved. They weren't being resolved. And today, now, today, with, with oil at... Uh, Nine, somewhere around ninety dollars a barrel. The country is is going is practically on the verge of de default. I mean, if you've been following what's going on in Venezuela, it is a complete disaster. Inflation of eighty percent in food, uh, fifty six percent across the board. Probably this year sixty percent. Uh, scarcity index of one third. So one third of the of the products you go to the store to buy you can't find. You stand in line for a, a chicken, and by the time you get there, you, there is nothing. Um, and and the worst part of this, so the, the, the disaster of cronyism, because they have four different uh, exchange, exchange rates, which, are, which is lending itself to arbitrage, you know, the arbi uh, uh, buying and selling currency, and who's getting the currency, the Chavistas, clearly. So the problem is that the benefits are going to the cronies, the other Chavistas, or to the clients, the, the people down at the very bottom. What's happening with the workers? I went to Guyana which was the old industrial belt. They were trying, you know, there was the idea of always trying to get off of oil. This, has been start, this started back in, under Romeo Betancourt in 1960 um, to get off of oil. So they began developing, because Venezuela has all kinds of minerals, iron, bauxite, diamonds, coltron, uh, uh, gold, I mean, every, all kinds of stuff uh, in, in the southern area the, of the state of Bolivar. Well, in, in that area, um, uh, Romeo Betancourt started uh, steel smelting, uh, Cedor, uh, uh, Venalum, uh, Carbonorca, they began uh, all these industries. And then Chavez came in, in in 2008, and some of these were actually nationalized, but he re-nationalized them and put generals in charge, essentially generals are in charge of the whole country now. Um, and he put these his cronies in. Uh, and, and one quick example is one, one of the people he put in in charge of Venalum came into the first meeting with his, to his board as president of the company of, the, of Venalum and sat down and said, so where are the aluminum mines? The ignorance was, and everyone sat there shocked in science, you mean this man thinks that you mine aluminum? And so the, the problem is that, so these workers, so the point of this is that these workers, the workers who uh, eight years ago were getting a pretty good wage, um, when they, as the, 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 these, uh, these companies were nationalized, the government decided not to negotiate their contracts any longer. In the, in the ensuing eight years, we've had 1,500% inflation. Their, their really good union wages in 2008 
uh, or 2006, um, what, what, what is it today? They're, they're barely hanging on. And, 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 and I, one of the workers took my camera, my video camera, into one of the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 on the shop floor, not a wheel turning, the, 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 uh, the cells inactive, the ovens caved in, so they haven't done any, any uh, maintenance of these things. So the workers and the middle class are getting nothing from the oil money, and, and they're being squeezed every day by... These, by this inflation, and the people down at the bottom are no longer getting anything. So that's the problem with number five. Just a follow up to that. Um, in my ignorance, when I think of Shabbat, Shabbat Zavon, and, and all that, I, I do think of worker cooperatives, but it, it sounds like there's not much of that really going on. So uh, my, my question is another uh, kind of model for worker cooperatives is the Madrigan Corporation. And I'm curious your thoughts on that, and if there's any of that really going on in, in Latin America, and particularly in, in Venezuela. Uh, nothing like that in Venezuela. I was in Mondragon in uh, 2006. It's a it's a big corporation. You know, they're, they're the, the 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 democracy takes place in Basque Country, and outside of Basque Country, I went to Eroski Market one of their markets in just outside of the Basque Country and went up to a couple of the employees and said, so how is it working for a cooperative? And they said, this is a cooperative? Oh, this, yeah, this is a cooperative. Well, I didn't know that. So, I mean, and I don't think, you know, really in a capitalist economy, the cooperatives are sound. Everyone is so on these things. I've worked in three different worker cooperatives. Uh, it's the last thing I ever want to do at this point. Um, but... You know, it can also be very good at a certain point in your life to work in a cooperative. And I'm saying, you know, yeah, it can be a good relief. But um, th the way they were done in Venezuela, it didn't work at all. Um, you can't make organize a cooperative from above. You, you ha it has to be something that takes place down from below. Now, in Argentina, there are some cooperatives that are, that are really pretty good. So. Yeah, no, I was going to say when you said from below, because there's one, one story in, in, in the book, one interview with... Um, a couple of women who are part of a seamstresses cooperative in Puerto Rico, Brazil, but this really did start from below. It's the opposite of the thing that um, you know, where Venezuela tried to see this huge program of cooperatives. This this was a project that grew out of um, a working class neighborhood in Puerto Alegre where. Um, a group of women got together, about 30 women, and they've been working together for now for about 17 years. And they produced all the bags for the last social forum in Puerto Alegre, and they've created a whole fair trade supply chain. Um, they decided it wasn't, you know, they were glad to be working in a cooperative factory, but they wanted everything that was part of their clothing to be also fair trade. So they found, you know, growers and spinners and people who made the buttons and the zippers so they could make a complete... Um, Chain, it's not, but that's different. You know, that's the, that's the co-op. So below. what would what would a, uh, a workplace at, the, at a national scale look like? I don't know. <laughs> where, where would it we can it be done on yeah. a? I mean, I think there's yeah. an interesting question about scale. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, hard for some of us who have tried to work for. 20, 30 years to, to support what we thought were our heroes, um, like Hugo Chavez and and, uh, and many of the others that you've mentioned. Um, so I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if um, if you can always find the bad side, the, the weaknesses in almost any government. For instance, I wonder what you think of the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, or, or the FMLN government when it happens to be elected in El Salvador. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was, I, I lived in Nicaragua under the Sandinistas. I really respected the Sandinista government because they had a comandancia. It was a, it was a comandancia. It was not a populist project. It was a, the attempt to build a revolutionary project, and people were accountable to each other within the comandancia. But I. Also, was very, uh, very like a lot of people, very upset with uh, the piñata. Um, you know about the piñata? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you just quickly what happened to the San Anista project in 1990 when they lost the election. Uh, the San Anista uh, Comandancia decided to divide up the wealth of the country, ostensibly to protect it for the people. Um, 
and they divided up among the comandantes and among their lower ranking people and even giving title of different lands to uh, heads of cooperatives. Uh, and this was called the piñata because they essentially left, they left the country in divide and took the wealth. And, uh, and these now the new, the people who'd gotten title to the cooperatives suddenly had a whole bunch of other cooperatives who were all working for them. Um, and some people didn't, didn't do that. The Cardinal brothers didn't do that. Uh, Ernesto and Fernando Cardinal didn't do that. Um, but uh, this was a, a real blow to a lot of us in the Solidarity Movement. And then, as was the fact that the base tried to democratize, and there was, there was a resistance on the part of the Comandancia, and gradually Daniel Ortega took over the party. The last, uh, uh, the last contest that was uh, freely allowed in the San Anista party was between Daniel Ortega and Victor Hugo Tinoco. We have an interview with Victor Hugo Tinoco. I recommend my chapter on, on the, my introduction to Venezuela, or to Nicaragua, as an introduction it's kind of a summary of that whole process. I don't demonize Ortega. I understand, uh, but but his the money that's come in from Venezuela, it's uh, the billions of dollars that have gone directly into Daniel Ortega's personal bank account. Um, he has a he has a a, a uh, and this is something you can verify for yourself online. Uh, go to uh, uh, Envio. Um, he he has had set up his own corporation the way Chavez had done in, in Venezuela, uh, the Condon, um, and. Uh, and he's bought the Hotel Seminole. His son now runs a Hotel Seminole. The Ortega uh, Murillo family is the wealthiest family and one of the wealthiest families in, in uh, Nicaragua. They've also uh, bought up uh, media. Now, I understand, I understand what you're saying. I'm not looking for bad things in these governments. I, what, I, what, I, what I argue in my book is because I come out of that same movement. 30 years ago, I was defending San Anistas. I was looking for the vanguard parties. I was supporting the vanguard parties that were taking the power of the state. I'm saying that that whole framework is now, it is, has been buried in the 20th century. We're looking at the 21st century and it's a completely different scenario. These governments are not revolutionary. They're, they're electoral. They have been elected to power. They are trying to maintain their, uh, their power the way that Obama is trying to maintain his power. And the way he, they do that is the same way. They get money, con contributions from corporations, and these corporations are now going in and mining their countries. And so, uh, and, but, but they have far less, far more opaque and less transparent processes in those countries um, so that we don't really even know where they're getting their money for, to run their elections. I, I think Pepe Mujica in, in Uruguay looks like a wonderful man. He looks like a great man, um, but uh, they're also they're, they're suffering from the problems of uh, the eucalyptus, uh, the soy, and the extractivist industries also there. So what I argue in my book is we need to distinguish between our anti-imperialist stance, which we maintain. We, there should be no intervention in these countries. We want to keep the United States uh, from intervening in these countries. But we want to start doing solidarity with people in the social movements. That those are the, that we want to be in solidarity with the people and the movements. You know, I give you an example. I try to imagine what it would be like if the Canadians decided they wanted to do solidarity with us in the United States. You know, with the people. They look down here and they go, "Well, you've got a progressive government now. Look at Bush. I mean, now you've got Obama. So we're going to support Obama." Some of them would say, "We're going to support Obama." And when Obama goes after, like last night, we were just in at Birmingham Books and uh, Leslie uh, James Pickering. Um, when you start. Uh, you know, trying to uh, imprison him and send him away and taking all these people out, uh, then, well, you know, all these things are going to, you know, that you're only looking at the dark side of this. I would say, I would argue, I think the Canadians, if they wanted to do solidarity with us, should be in solidarity with us when we're trying to stop fracking here. I'd say, we want to protect our water. We're not getting anything out of fracking. I mean, you know, we want, we want our water. And so we want the Canadians and the people who want to do solidarity with us, hey, stand with us against our own government when we want democracy. I mean, that's what these students were asking for in, in Venezuela. And what was the response of Maduro to shoot tear gas into buildings, apartment buildings, where there were children and elder, elderly, uh, to ha to shooting uh, with National Guardsmen, shooting live rounds with, with colectivos. So these are questions that I think we need to be looking at and saying, do we want to support that? I, I, have, I have stated publicly, and I have, I'm no longer publishing at Counterpunch because they don't want to publish me and, and a couple of other websites because they don't want to hear from me anymore, but I've publicly said I am not going to support this government any longer. 
I am going to continue to support the people of Venezuela, the Pemon indigenous people who are now facing, Maduro signed a contract with, with Russian and Chinese capitalists to mine coal, and they're going to be poisoning the rivers that the Pemon drink from and cook from, and, and uh, the, 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 excuse me, the Yupa, the Yupa in, in Sulia, um, and the workers in, 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 um, who are fighting in Sidor, in, in uh, Guyana. We don't hear anything at all about them. We don't hear their voices. These people have been on strike essentially for almost a year. They've, shut, they've been shutting down the, the largest steel plant. If you took the, the paved area of the steel plant from, you could, you could do a, a highway from Caracas all the halfway across the country. They, it's a huge, huge plant. They have shut, the workers have shut this down. Why? Because the, the, the government has been so completely anti-worker. So these are the questions that I think we really, we really need to educate ourselves. We wrote this book as a resource. I mean, it's not going to be the kind of thing you're going to sit down and read cover to cover. But when you want to find out about what's going on in Venezuela, we, we hope that, and we, we have Chavistas there. We have a Chavista. We have a Chavista representative. We have a, two critical Chavistas and one very uncritical Chavista, from my point of view. We have two people from the opposition. And, and so we're representing a broad range of voices, but we're, the, the introductions to each of them, we hope, will you know, be useful to people uh, as a resource. So I'm with you. I mean, I, I, I think it's been, it's been very hard. I, when I got back from Venezuela last April, I hid under the covers for a couple of months, trying to think of how I was going to deal with this and how I was going to come out. And I had to come out. I had to be honest. I had to tell the truth, because I think that's what, I, think that's what we have to do as activists. We have to come out and tell the truth. No matter how how painful it is. I really appreciate what you just said, and I'd like you to speak a little bit to the uprisings in Brazil and what's going on there with the young people who are out. Have they really? And um, I lived there for a little bit, and I'm just curious on your take on that. You know, actually, um, Brazil. Neither of us has been to Brazil, so um, we have material from activists that we're, you know, close to and respect in there. So I you probably know more about it than, than we do. Um, but I think that what I mean just from, you know, what I've read and heard on Democracy Now! and whatnot is that, that it's, um, the, it, it's the contradictions between social movements and governments. You know, the Workers' Party came in with a great deal of hope and then the, the landless workers movement, for example, which um, you know they they critically back. They don't you know totally throw their lot in it, but they've been having a lot of contradiction with um, the first Lula and then Rousseff. You know, more more state repression, less land distributed. So I think that's just part of the you know nature of these things that we have to look a little bit more deeply in. You know, Brazil very deep into industrial agriculture and the landless movement is now um, they're interesting they're, sh they're broadening their policy goals from just not only redistribution of land but they want more sustainable farming they call it people's agrarian reform um, so away from such so much monoculture and use of pesticides into you know growing things that people can use and growing it more sustainably so we, we do have an interview that our webmaster is going to put up at our website, LatinAmericanSocialMovements.org, uh, with a woman from the uh, social, from the landless movement in Brazil, and she touches on this a little bit, but yeah. not not much in depth. But we're gonna we're gonna try to get that up really soon. There was a, a question we had. Yeah, I, I mean, I sort of um, I, I wanted to ask a question about the um, sort of the the like the the like co-management things that were created in some of those uh, I mean I know particularly in, in Venezuela the sort of experiments in like these weird like sort of worker control and sort of state management control that sort of thing and I know there were some like community versions of that too like municipal council-y things um, that were supposed to be more participatory um, and I know that there was um, that there there had been a, a, a debate particularly within the the anarchist movement in Venezuela uh, where the, the Revolutionary Anarchist Federation of Venezuela was for um, sort of entering these and tr sort of trying to get the people who are already in them to like try to push them past their design limits or whatever. And then that there was a publication uh, at Libertario that was very, you know, that's, you know, that's collaboration with the capitalist government and shouldn't do that and blah, blah, blah. And I sort of wondered if there's, um, I mean, in Venezuela or anywhere else where that applies, what the sort of um, 
uh, how that how that debate has has played out, I guess, and if you guys have a particular. Uh, uh, I spent about a third of this book uh, talking about Venezuela. Um, if you see it as a populist project, which which I do, um, the and well, and actually we have an interview in this in our book with uh, Orlando Chirino, who uh, is a union activist who. Um, uh, talks a little bit about this. He talks about worker control as being control of workers. Um, and the cohesión really didn't, uh, it's, it, you know, the problem with populism is everybody, you're either in the project or you're not in the project. And if you're not in the project, you don't get any of the patronage, you don't get any of the, the goodies. And if you're in the project, you get the goodies, but you have to do what the, the leader says. In this case, it was Chavez. Um, so. Uh, they, they, one of the problems is that it hasn't really worked in um, in the basic industries because they haven't been giving people the goodies. The fact that 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 the workers haven't they haven't even discussed a collective contract for you know eight years, um, it means that even the people who are supposedly co-managing, well, I suppose you can get some people, you can pay them, to, and you can get people in there who can. Uh, they, and supposedly the, there was some, one of the leaders who signed the. the the contract with CEDOR, I was just mentioning CEDOR. CEDOR is a really big issue in Venezuela. It's not being hear, heard here because the left here in the United States is so pro-Chavez and that they're not willing to, to even look at, at, at what anyone who is having problems with the government is saying. I mean, you know, this during this uh, uprising in February, all the students were supposedly, we were, we were expected to believe that the students in Chile were independent, but the ones in Venezuela were all paid by the U.S. government. I mean, you know, I know the people from El Libertario. I did an interview with Raúl uh, Uscategui, and and I consider him a friend. I translated some of his work uh, until you know as long as people were willing to publish it, and then people decided they weren't willing to publish it anymore. Um, and and uh, th their their logic was not just that simple. It was a lot more complicated. And the fact was, what they were what they're looking at here, they're very clear that this is a populist project, and 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 populism ends up. Going the same way. I mean, Perón, uh, Julio Vargas, they, they all end up eventually in the same place. It's, it, and we're now seeing uh, it play out. And I go into this here in depth. I think that we're going to see this in this next year. We're going to see explosions are happening now with the Chavistas. We're not getting much of it here in the U.S. Uh, but when, it, when people start dying, we'll, it'll get back on the news radar again. But um, So, cohesión, I would say, they're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to get a, a workers. Uh, the Bolivarian workers' force going uh, in all these, uh, you know, across the country. They're trying to uh, implement a corporatist political project, but they they no longer have any goodies to spread around. They're having to borrow money from Chevron, two billion dollars from Chevron. They're bringing the Bank of America in to sell their gold for them. Um, they're 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 really getting desperate. And uh, yeah, I, I think there's something else. There's something else. Um, that in, in the Until the Rulers Obey, that was a really interesting reflection on the whole question of um, communal councils. Um, we have a, an interview with a fabulous woman named Maria Vicenta Davila. She lives in, um, in, the, in, in the state of Merida, up in the Andes. When we went to visit her, we were walking up a hill, it was about a 30 degree incline, and in this very high altitude, having to stop practically every 20 feet and catch our breath. But she's lived there and worked there uh, all her life, and she's um, comes out of the popular education movement in the 1970s, and she's actually participated in a lot of international gatherings of campesino women, so she's a very well-known organizer. She comes from this root of popular education, which is really at the root of a lot of the, the social movements that played a huge role, and um, she talks about the relationship of the communal councils, and there was a whole network of popular education projects in this area, um, her town of Mucuchies and in the uh, municipality of Rangel. And when the government began to construct communal councils, they constructed parallel organizations. So these, these groups that had been there for a long time were kind of, you know, cut out of the process. And um, she, she says this, she ta I'll, I'll just read you what she says because I, I, I like her comment here. Um, she, um, she says, we're, we're no longer working directly in the community because, unfortunately, there's not the support for that. I say that not wanting to offend anyone in the state, but the state is supporting the community councils, 
So there's no support for a grassroots organization that has been born without any great promotion that has created its own laws and rules for itself, like the CEP, which was their, their network. Um, if you look at the structure of the community councils, you can see that it comes in part from the CEPs. This is something that the President Chavez has mentioned a lot because it was an idea of Paulo Freire. The proposal of Paulo Freire was to generate a process of social justice from the most dispossessed. That's been the idea behind the organizations here in Mukaches. The majority of the community councils that have been successful and the people who formed part of them at the municipal level, and there are a lot of them, all have a history of which we've been a part and we all come from this process of popular education. So I think that speaks a bit to the nature of the councils, you know, a bit more. And there's there's some other commentary on that about, you know, have they the idea is good, but do they manage to be independent? And I think that's a key question that a lot of people uh, in the book are looking at is, you know, how do you have your independent social movement organizations? Yeah, and I think the other thing, too, is they've supplanted the autonomous neighborhood councils that existed in Venezuela prior to them. And this is part of the whole, the way populism works. You've got the leader <coughs> who looks around at all the independent forces uh, in, in, the, in the country and says, how can I take these over? because he's trying to extend his power. And, and what he's doing in, in the case of the community councils is they're directly funded by the president. They're directly funded. And if, and if, they're, if the community council doesn't happen to be Chavista, um, they have difficulty getting their, uh, getting, getting their, uh, um, the, you know, the, the, their accreditation or the, being, uh, getting their funding. And, uh, and, and this has been, this is something I, I talk a little bit more also in, in, in this book. So it's, it's a, it's a, there are, are a lot of issues with this, and uh, yeah, that's, I think that pretty much says it, yeah. Do you see a country as, is it, can a country possibly have a government that works, or is it only possible to have a series of autonomous groups? Yeah. Well, no, you know, I'm not an anarchist. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm just, I, I'm not, I'm not implying I, that, I've just tried, I'm tried not, to understand no, but I'm, that. I'm saying, I'm saying I do think that you could have a government but I think you need to have a government. I mean, I think the idea here that we have in this country of checks and balances and institutions that are independent, that can, that can be a force to try to keep the other, when, when somebody gets, I mean, if we had that in this country, if we had a CIA, for instance, under uh, popular uh, jurisdiction or under some kind of jurisdiction, um, so I know I do see a, play, a role for a government. I think that what one of the governments in Uruguay is a good example of, of a very functional government. Um, I think the question about that, that the, author, the author of our introduction, Raul Sabeci, raises about how they've co-opted the social movements uh, is another question. But on the other hand, those movements have kind of come into the government and they, uh, they've, you know, they've gotten something out of it. Um, is it a populist project? No. He, they still have independent branches of government. Uh, there, therefore, the reforms are very move very slowly, um, but it, but it, but they move, and they 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 come by a matter of consensus to certain um, agreements and 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 force. Now, you know, I, I know some people would disagree with me and say that all governments are the same, and you know, blah blah blah, and that's fine. Uh, I do think there's a role for a government. Um, I just don't think that populism is a good model. It really is a very bad model, um, and especially when you start talking about patronage and clientelism, and um, you know, giving all this power to uh, to a leader. But I think the the other thing too, um, and we didn't we didn't touch on this a, a lot tonight. Sometimes we talk about it more, um, but it is the fact that these um, progressive governments are so hemmed in by all of the, you know, transnational capitalist institutions like, you know, the, the World Bank and company. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example. In El Salvador, we have a story of some anti-mining resistance um, in the community of San Isidro in the Department of Cabañas, where people have been, you know, fighting. And with, with folks all over the country in El Salvador have really succeeded in putting the brakes on gold mining. Um, there was a company named Pacific Rim, Canadian company, sold to Oceana Gold, and you know the story, right? Well, um, the social movements in El Salvador succeeded in getting three successive governments to deny permits for mining, but now the company is suing the country of El Salvador, right, in a court affiliated with the World Bank called the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, which is a completely non-transparent, 
um, or organism is suing the country of El Salvador for $350 million. And so there's a question of where is the sovereignty of the countries, and that's some of the limits also that the governments are up against, that the social movements are also contending with. And um, several, several of the activists in our book also you know, speak to that question, speak to the, the need for us to be really you know, seeing this international picture and actually trying to organize collectively, which is a whole different sense of solidarity also. Well, you know, um, we could we could continue this. Is, well, we could hang out a little bit longer and talk. Um, I just want to let you know that the books, our book, uh, is for sale. We're selling this one for thirty dollars. The other one is ten, and we're selling the two of them as a set for thirty-five. So, if you're interested in buying some copies, you're welcome to come up. We take credit cards, we take checks, and we take cash. If you're interested, we can also continue this conversation um, if you like. Um, Yeah. At one point you mentioned something that I was just wanted to ask a question about that uh, you pointed out that uh, when you're talking about the poverty and the war on poverty, you've already sort of dug yourself into a bit of a hole and you just keep digging. And as opposed to talking about wealth. And I, I don't know if there was more to be said about that as a you know kind of way of understanding, because this is this is a lot that you put out, a lot. It's excellent. I'm really appreciative of it, but it's it's a lot to take in. It sort of turns upside down some of you know what most of us here probably come in with. Maybe there isn't yeah. something more there. Well, no, there's a lot more there. I mean, <laughs> there's so much more, and in fact, that's the crux of the whole thing. It seems to me. I mean, are we going to talk about equalization of wealth, or are we going to just talk about helping the poor people? Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, and that is probably we we could stay the rest of the night here talking about those things, right? And and that seems like a fundamental starting point, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't yeah, it yeah, I think it is. Yeah, that's what I thought too. I was fascinated when you said about how we talk about what are yeah. we going to do to eliminate poverty and what are we going to do for the poor, and we don't talk about what are we going to do to eliminate wealth, yeah. which is the creator of the poverty. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, we're constantly attacking um, the uh, disease, but not the microorganism that, can, that uh, does the disease. And uh, that, that would be to my way of thinking. And I think that in organizing, that would be even a more popular um, and would certainly uh, put an end to the um, poor as the uh, you know the poor as the sinners. You know they're 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 bad. They're faulty, and that's why they're poor. Um, because that that look at at the why they're poor is the place no one ever wants to go. So I, I was fascinated with that. Yeah, and also taxing working people to pay welfare benefits is uh, is exactly the best way of dividing the poor from the working class, which is what. We don't want to be doing, and so the the problem that I've been hearing, and you know, we 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 went on our first date. We had this whole argument about welfare, the welfare system, welfare reform. It was that dates us, right? We we this is during Clinton, welfare reform. I'm I'm like, yes, way to go, welfare reform. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? We need to have a different kind of system. This system destroys people. I remember going on welfare and getting within an inch of it and seeing how it worked and then figuring it out and saying, oh yeah, now the question is what are we going to do to replace welfare? What are we going to do to transform welfare? It's not about getting rid of it and saying, you know, like the Republicans want to do. We can agree as far as that, that it's a bad system. Now we've got to figure out how can we transform our economy so that poor people are included and brought into the economy and not just, you know, thrown some crumbs down and demeaned and belittled and destroyed. Um, well, and that's why the fight for 15 is so important, right? I mean, you have people, fast food workers, you have to be yeah. able to work at that kind of a job. But every any time you yes. talk about that, it's me, oh, you're, you know, you know the response to it. Well, and it's but, still it still makes them, you know, like, well, what are they doing? I mean, that they deserve that. Why don't they get two or three jobs? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, yeah, yeah. the it's just right. the vitriol is terrible. Mm -hmm.